In this lecture, we're going to be looking at chapter 2, about arguments by example. When advancing arguments by example, it's important to recognize that we're using inductive logic, so our arguments will admit of degrees of strength and weakness. An argument by example that depends entirely on one example may not be as strong as an argument with many examples. Furthermore, your examples must follow rule 3 about reliability, which means our examples need to be carefully researched. Using representative examples is another important rule. Since we may be generalizing from our examples to a larger group, we need to diversify our examples to strengthen our arguments. For an extreme example, imagine your argument is about the social implications of men's fashion. To generalize from your examples to a global or a local population, you'll need to ensure your examples are representative of the majority. However, if you only research the men of the Wadabi tribe in Africa, your findings and conclusions will be vastly different from the majority of Western cultures. Our text gives us an interesting example to illustrate this point. The Bermuda Triangle is famous as a place where many ships and planes have mysteriously disappeared. There have supposedly been several dozen disappearances in the past decade. At first, this sounds shocking and mysterious, but how many vessels have passed through that area in the past decade? If thousands, maybe dozens in a decade isn't very many. How about other areas? Are they comparable to the Bermuda Triangle, or do they have higher rates of disappearance? There are other great examples given, but the basic takeaway is that background rates are crucial for concluding something like the Bermuda Triangle is extremely dangerous to travel through. Considering counterexamples is extremely important, regardless of the type of argument you're advancing or analyzing, because it helps with the rule we'll introduce later in Chapter 8 on considering objections. Start thinking along these lines now, because understanding your own arguments and the strength of your own beliefs will depend in part on how well you understand views that are antithetical to your own. Don't just read oppositions to your view, cultivate them. Make them as strong as possible and test your beliefs against them. Do your arguments stand up to these objections? Do you need to strengthen your beliefs and arguments? Or maybe you need to abandon them completely? This will require intellectual modesty, humility, and even courage. Sometimes, it's difficult to let go of beliefs, even when all of the evidence suggests we're wrong. But remember, the game we're playing in logic, the sciences, and philosophy is one of logical defensibility. We can argue illogically outside of class for these beliefs, but here, it's a violation of the rules. To digress, consider the example from our text that concludes, in general, wars are caused by the desire for territorial domination. To discover counterexamples, conduct research with this as your guiding question. Are all wars caused by the desire for territorial domination? Some counterexamples listed in our text are revolutions and civil wars. Techniques for adjusting and weakening claims are covered as well. With this, you may be wondering, why would I want to weaken my claim? Well, consider this argument. I make the absolute claim that no student wears sandals. Therefore, no student in this class ever wears sandals. This isn't just a strong claim, it's too strong, it's absolute. All it takes is one counterexample to prove this conclusion wrong. So, sometimes, we need to weaken our claims to strengthen our arguments. Another technique suggested in our text is revision and qualification of conclusions. For example, we might revise and qualify our previous conclusion to Wars between independent states are caused by the desire for territorial domination. Even this may overgeneralize, but at least it's more defensible than the original. Of course, 
You may want to argue against the counterexamples. If someone objects to your argument claiming that it wasn't the desire for territorial domination that caused the war, but instead a network of mutual defense pacts, you could use the previous weakening strategy, or you could object that this is not actually a counterexample. For example, you might argue that the desires for European powers to dominate Europe were the motives for the mutual defense pacts. So, this intended counterargument now serves as another example in support of your argument. This last point is important. People often think that they're providing a counterargument or counterexamples when they're not. For example, later in the course, we'll analyze William Paley's watchmaker argument for the existence of God. A person A argues in agreement with Paley that God is a possible candidate explanation for the origin of life in the universe, but person B objects, no, God is not a possible candidate since the complexity of organisms is explained by evolution by natural selection. Can you see the problem? Person A is talking about the origin of life and the universe, while person B is talking about the development of complexity of already existent life in an already existent universe. For anything to be a counterexample, counterargument, or counterexplanation, it must explain the same thing as the target. I've witnessed this same error in reasoning countless times in quotidian discourse. For example, my neighbor advanced a very strange argument about her brother. She was criticizing him to her sister, something along the lines of, yeah, Sam has been lifting weights all the time at the gym because he's trying to get big, but Terrence lost 20 pounds just by running, so... The so was left hanging, but you can see what she's getting at. Her criticism is that going running is better than going to the gym, because Terrence lost weight doing it. Not only is this the person who fallacy, it also isn't a counterargument. Running is a cardiovascular exercise that many people pursue toward the goal of losing weight. However, Sam's goal is building muscle, which is why he is pursuing weight training. These are two different goals, with two different methods of achieving them. Even though she thinks she has a relevant argument, she doesn't. These examples lead to the final point of this chapter. The text reads, Also try to think of counterexamples when you're assessing others' arguments. Ask whether their conclusions might have to be revised and limited, whether perhaps those conclusions might have to be given up entirely, or whether a supposed counterexample might be reinterpreted as another example. The same rules apply to anyone else's arguments as apply to yours. If we turn back to the paper I'll be writing as an example for this course, we'll see that providing counterexamples may be a more efficient strategy than providing examples. Look at the standard form of my proposed argument again. Premise 1. Everything that happens has a cause. Premise 2. The Big Bang happened. Therefore, the Big Bang had a cause that I call God. As you can see, to prove that everything that happens has a cause seems to demand potentially infinite examples. So, I could probably adopt one of the strategies we've discussed in this chapter, perhaps in a modified form. Are there any counterexamples to premise one? In my search for counterexamples, I found two potential theoretical challenges to my argument from metaphysics and quantum mechanics. For example, at the quantum level, particles seem more probabilistic than causally deterministic, so it's not clear that their behaviors have causes in the usual sense. In quantum field theory, virtual particles seem to pop in and out of existence without a direct cause. So, these examples show potential as possible counterarguments. So what strategy should I adopt? Shall I revise, weaken, or otherwise qualify my conclusion? Could I reinterpret the counterarguments as examples in support of my conclusion? Or could I refute them? 
and show that they're not counterexamples at all. These are things I'll need to think about as I write my paper, and they're things you'll have to think about as you write yours.